Welcome back to Selling Your Business with David King. I'm David King, and I'm the author of Selling Your Business, Begin with the End in Mind, which is available on Amazon. Today, we're lucky to be joined by Ken Burke of Burke Law Group in Los Angeles. Welcome, Ken. Thank you very much. Ken is a corporate transactional attorney, and he has a subspecialty in the cannabis industry, which is a, an industry that raises a variety of different regulatory and structural issues that are unique to cannabis and, and no other. So it's, a, it's an evolving and uh, unique field, and any attorney that uh, bravely goes out onto the thin ice of cannabis law um, is worthy of commendation. So today we're going to talk about mergers and acquisitions within this unique industry of cannabis. Uh, so, Ken, why don't we just start with just a general introduction about, tell us more about yourself, your professional background, and uh, what you do for clients today. Okay, well, sure. Um, it's scary, but I've been doing this for 33 years, <clears throat> which kind of freaks me out a bit uh, <laughs> that I've been practicing transactional law for 33 years. I don't feel that old, but my gray hair certainly shows it. Um, and, and I'm a purely transactional guy. You know, I don't do any litigation. So we do from corporate formation, capital raises, safe agreements, which are called simple agreements for future equity, uh, convertible promissory notes, um, and then all the compliance issues that cannabis companies face. Uh, during their operational life, and then ultimately a liquidity event, which typically is a strategic sale. Um, so that's that's my practice, purely transactional. I do deals, you know, and I, and I get deals done. And that's my practice. You know, UCLA undergrad, Loyola Law School, went to a mega firm, you know, out of school uh, called Brian Cave, McFeeders and McRoberts. I was in in-house with a company called Allied Signal, now Honeywell International. I was general counsel of their turbocharger business, which was about a billion dollars a year in sales. And all kinds of cats and dogs come crawling in your office when you're general counsel someplace, particularly of a business of that size. Um, and now, you know, back in, in private practice for the last uh, 22 years, um, and bringing that kind of uh, perspective, that in-house perspective and businessmen's perspective to the practice of law. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started a number of companies uh, that are quite successful, the latest of which is a company called PayQuick, which is a banking solution in the cannabis space. Um, so that's about it. Um, and I'm here to help out. And hopefully your viewers will, uh, will learn something positive and, and productive from, uh, from this session. Perfect. Well, you're exactly who we need to hear from today. Tell us about your, your services within the cannabis sector. What, what types of clients do you serve? What type of services are you provided, providing for them? What stages, what sorts of transactions, maybe leading up to an exit strategy um, and the exit events? Just tell us broadly what you're doing for these clients. Sure. Well, it starts obviously with the corporate or LLC formation. <clears throat> it uh, continues through licensing and helping them get their both their local uh, license, which obviously you need before you can get a state license, and then um, getting the state license. And whether that's a manufacturer, distributor, cultivator, you know, retail storefront, non-storefront uh, retail operation, whatever they happen to need. You know, and then in the life of the business, if they are leasing property to someone, I'm sorry, if they're leasing property from somebody, and I actually represent a lot of landlords who lease properties to cultivators and manufacturers and distributors um, and build in special provisions to those leases. So again, it's, you know, it's the contracts, whatever kind of contracts, and you know M&A, so, um, and our transactional lawyer as well. So whatever kind of contracts they need. I like to say when, you, when their clients are thinking, you know what, we should put that in writing that's the time to, uh, to contact me with respect to a uh, cannabis business. Understood, understood. So cannabis clients, and let's take, for example, just dispensaries. Would you say that's probably the majority of, of what you're representing these days? Actually, it's not. It's oh, mostly okay. cultivators, uh, manufacturers, okay. and distribution, distributors with a couple of testing labs. Um, a few dispensaries, but it's not the majority of, of the practice by, okay. by far. Well, um, let me stick with dispensaries, though, because I think mm -hmm. that that's probably the broader population of different different small businesses that are out there in the cannabis space. Um, 
the 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 startup phase of of a cannabis dispensary, and and it can, I know it's unique uh, by locality first and foremost to get the entitlements to use property for uh, you know to get a use permit, not to get too far into technical details, but to get a use permit locally to operate property for for a can as a cannabis dispensary. Do you typically have to have both the owner of the property and the business that's going to be operating a cannabis dispensary? Both of them need to be uh, permittees on a license like that issued by the local authorities. Well, no, they, they don't have to be permittees if the if the landlord you know owns the building and is mm -hmm. just leasing the property uh, to the cannabis tenant. Then they don't both need to be permittees. Only the um, only the tenant is. Okay. Um, but even before that stage, as someone decides they want to get into the retail space, say they're just starting out, you know, they got to put their management team together. They got to raise money. You know, typically it's friends and family money um, at the beginning. Um, it's very tough to put a valuation on the business at that point. So what we do for those clients is we'll do a convertible note. Um, which is a promissory note that converts to equity at a future valuation based on their next capital raise and is a discount to that next capital raise, or what's called a safe agreement, which is a simple agreement for future equity, which pretty much does the same thing, but it's not debt. So, you know, you, you find your prospective investors, your friends and family, and if they're not going to give you money outright, you enter into either a convertible promissory note or a safe agreement with them in order to raise the funds and to get off the ground. My main piece of advice, because we've done this a lot of times and I've done it personally, um, is whenever you're raising money and you're starting a new cannabis business, or frankly, any business for that matter, assume that it's going to take you twice as long and it's going to cost you twice as much as you think. So as you put together your model, and it's critical that you put together a financial model that shows your five-year projections for that business, that's what your investors are going to want to see, um, spend a lot of time on that. Um, and on the, it's basically an Excel spreadsheet where you put in certain assumptions and you can predict your per future revenues and profitability. But when you are putting in your costs and expenses, it's like a P&L, like a profit and loss statement that, move, that goes forward with projections. Again, everything's going to take you twice as long and cost twice as much. So if you think you need to raise a half a million dollars, you need to raise a million bucks, um, et cetera. Understood. Well, your description of, of early financing for participants in the cannabis industry, I think would be music to the ears of, of a lot of different cannabis participants, maybe in other markets, maybe because Los Angeles is, has a more well-developed cannabis industry, uh, more acceptance in the market because a lot of localities, just in a lot of markets, the, the cannabis businesses that want to raise money, really they have to go out and get these hard money loans with the ex exorbitant fees and, and crazy interest rates and, uh, you know, secured with your firstborn. Um, so can you kind of break it out that you know, sometimes businesses do need to go down the path of these sorts of hard money lending uh, terms and, and sometimes you may be able to raise money that's more like conventional corporate early stage finance that you described? Do, well, do you know, um, you know? as far as most of the, you know, the, the hard money lenders that I know are, are the real estate guys and they're not lending into cannabis. You know, they're, they're just not. Um, it's when, if you're doing just a dispensary, cause I think that's the example we're, we're dealing with. It's even tough to get to the Casa Verdes of the world and some of the smaller VC firms that are lending into the space. I don't see, or, um, financing this space. <clears throat> I don't see them doing, you know, simple retail dispensary deals. I really don't. They're looking for, um, you know, large distribution operations, um, or manufacturing or cultivation operations. So you really, if you're just doing a cannabis store, you're, in my experience, you're looking at mom and pop money, you know, friends and family kind of, uh, of investors um, who believe in you, you know, they believe in the industry, but more importantly, they believe in you as, as the entrepreneur that you are going to bust your butt to, uh, to do everything you can to make that business successful. So that's really where I'm, I'm seeing it. And with those folks, you know, you're either going to get straight equity, they're going to buy common stock or common units in an LLC, um, or they're going to, uh, to do a convertible note or safe agreement, which is a little bit better for them. And then the note, you know, it's got, if it's a note, it's got an interest rate, you know, and it typically has a 20% reduction uh, in stock price to the next equity raise. Um, 
but I, you're, you're looking at friends and family for the uh, for the small retail establishment. Okay, well that that, that makes sense, and I, I probably used the wrong term by describing it as hard money, but I've been thinking of loans that are secured by the property with terms that aren't anything like a conventional mortgage. Um, but um, we'll move on from financing and move into kind of other structural differences between say a typical business with an entity that operates and a typical cannabis business, which often has multiple different entities operating together kind of to run one business. My experience there's you know, one that owns the property, one management company, one uh, state license touch the plant company. Can you kind of describe the, the typical structure and, and how these entities have to interrelate? Sure. Well, and, and that structure was re really grew out of the fact that cannabis was illegal federally and didn't have access to banking. So you would need to have a management company that would essentially, you know, be able to get a bank account. Um, the licensed entity typically could not. The landlord sometimes could or sometimes couldn't get a bank account, depending on how much the bank wanted to know about, you know, where the revenue for the landlord was coming. Um, but now as the industry has progressed, um, I'm not seeing that much of a structure anymore. And I don't really think it's needed. You know, you don't, you don't need that kind of structure. You can have one entity that is the operational entity and uh and it runs the business and you know it either can or can't get a banking relationship my clients i've got a relationship obviously both with PayQuick as a as a co-founder of the company that i can get them PayQuick accounts assuming they meet all the the hurdles that PayQuick proposes or in um, requires for purposes of know your customer due diligence etc or i work with uh with a credit union that will open uh bank accounts for my clients they only accept cannabis clients by referral. Um, and so I bank with them and I have been able to refer my clients to them in order to get them a bank account. Um, and with that, then you don't really need this, you know, three tiered structure uh, to manage the business. You can really do it either with one or with two. Typically, and I do recommend to clients that whoever owns the real estate, that's always a separate LLC or corporation and then leases that property to the cannabis business. Um, I don't recommend that clients um, have the same entity operating their cannabis business as are uh, owning the property. You're much better to do a, a lease arrangement. Even if you own both companies, you're still better off having a separate entity own the real estate and lease it to the operating entity. Okay. Again, Ken, that this must be music to the ears of, of businesses that are out there kind of operating with these legacy structures that are more cumbersome and frustrating to figure out their financing and their operations. So that, that's good that there is a, there's room for people to go to Ken and get current on the most efficient way to structure and to operate and to run your finances. That's that's great news. Generally, and if it's just kind of a survey here, could you touch upon just a few of the major regulatory issues that are unique to cannabis businesses? Sure. Well, it, it's a myriad of regulations that you've got to comply with because you've got to comply not only with all the local rules and regulations, you know, from fire safety to waste management, uh, security systems, having all the proper SOPs in place, standard operating procedures in place. Um, if you happen to be manufacturing edibles, you know, now you're making a product that somebody is consuming. Um, and so you've got all of those requirements to comply with. Um, so it, it really runs the, the gamut. And it's kind of, you know, you, you pick them off one at a time, but you, you keep your arms around the whole. Um, and if depending on which jurisdiction you're in, some of the more egregious ones or the, well, I shouldn't say egregious, but the ones that, you know, have more sophisticated requirements, they'll, by complying with those, you're typically going to comply with your state requirements as well. Um, so you're not going to have a whole bunch of separate state issues to deal with. Um, but, you know, the, the main things that, that we see, at least on the retail level, you know, is, you know, check IDs, and most folks are doing this, we find, you know, check IDs both at the door, check it again at the point of sale. Um, obviously, with COVID, you're going to want to comply with all of those requirements, making sure everybody is masked up, limiting the number of people that are in your store uh, at any one time, um, and that type of thing. So that's, I mean, that's the main thing that, that typically is going to trip people up 
um, and you'll and they'll get violated. They'll get a notice to violation from the state or locally. Um, and there are secret shoppers out there, you know. So check those IDs. Um, the state does send out secret shoppers uh, to who are underage um, to see if they can get into a store and, and make a sale. The other thing is, you know, there's a, a there's pressure to to sell non licensed product in your store. Don't do it. You know, just don't do it. Um, I know from a profitability standpoint, making a profit at a retail store is very difficult because of the tax structure and because of Internal Revenue Code Section 280E, which prevents them from deducting ordinary business expenses other than cost of goods sold. Um, so you, you got to run a really tight ship. But, you know, these days, if, if you want to survive it as a legal business, you know, you've got to cross all your T's and dot all your I's. Help me with that one, because it always, it's, it seems counterintuitive. The tax code says, no, this is an illegal industry. We, we don't want you doing this. And, and so it's still illegal under federal law. So when you file your tax return, we won't let you deduct any expenses other than the cost of your cannabis. That, that seems like the one thing that they wouldn't let them deduct. Um, <laughs> if, if, but, you know, t take logic and put it on its head and there's federal law. Uh, help me out with that. What, is there any ra rhyme or reason why that's the only expense they allow cannabis businesses to deduct? You know, um, there's no rhyme or reason to it other than, look, it's illegal federally. Right. So as long as it's illegal federally, they've got to keep 280E in place. Um, otherwise, you're going to allow lots of other criminal enterprises to start deducting business expenses. I mean, I think that's how they got Al Capone on tax evasion, because he was taking deductions for ordinary business expenses. And that's how they got him. So they're not changing 280E. Right? They're not going to change 280E. Any illegal enterprise is not going to be, to be able to deduct business expenses. It's one of the ways that the government can get them for tax evasion, criminally. Uh, the, the change really has to come with a rescheduling of cannabis to a, a Schedule two or Schedule three controlled substance. And obviously, you know, we got an election less than a month away. You know, nothing is happening in Washington right now. But if there is a, a change in Washington uh, coming up, I think in the next four or five years or four years, uh, we may see some reform with respect to uh, descheduling or rescheduling of cannabis. In fact, uh, Kamala Harris last night in the debate came out and said that one of her elements of, of her and Biden's platform is to, is to you know, decriminalize cannabis on the federal level, which would be huge because that's going to then allow states um, to do what they want individually for adult use cannabis or medicinal cannabis. Um, and it's going to, it would solve the 280E problem. This may be just a, a wise tale rumor throughout the industry, but I understood that a number of years back, you know, you post the coal memo, there were hearings set with the DEA, the, uh, uh, any case of the, the drugs, the FDA, uh, on that very same issue, on d moving cannabis down from Schedule 1 to, to a lower degree. Um, and right before these hearings were set to be heard, this was when Obama's daughter was caught on uh, a video <laughs> at, at Lollapalooza smoking a joint and then the, the political pressure that he couldn't put to it enough capital into that thing, so they took him off hearings. Maybe true, maybe not, but uh, it's, a, it's a funny story if it is true. Um, it just shows that somebody's going to have to put some political capital into this, but it's, it's kind of a, it's a glacial thing, but it's going to happen. That's kind of once they open up the gates, though, and that, that's why, and this would be a good segue here, that's why there's all these people waiting, the smart money's there, writing it out for the time when the, the, all the conventional financing, the banking, the big industry participants can come in and take a stake in this. Um, let, let's move on then to mergers and acquisitions, exit strategies, and what you're saying, because that, that's the subject today. We do everything perfectly from day one. We come see Ken on day one. We set up our business properly. We go, do our banking right. We do everything by the book perfectly, 
and we're, we're ready to be acquired. Who's going to acquire us? What are they looking for? What, what are the typical businesses making the acquisitions? What are they looking for? Uh, how's the deal going to work? Take us through this process here. Sure. So there's a, a couple of very large, well-financed uh, cannabis businesses that are doing what in the industry, in any industry, is called a roll-up. Right. And a roll up is where, you know, you, you get a bunch, a bunch of money behind you and you look for a industry that's very fractured in its ownership. And you start going and buying all the little moms and pops out there um, and rolling them up into a larger uh, company, basically owning them all, rebranding them MedMen you know, was, uh, was doing that and trying to find either open their own shops or find others, buy them, and then rebrand them as MedMen stores. So, you know, to do that, you got to have a lot of capital. Um, there's some publicly held companies out of Canada that are attempting to do that. There's some privately held companies here in the U.S. that are trying to do that. Um, and with varying degrees of success, you know, it's tough because cannabis licenses are not transferable. The local licenses are not transferable. So you typically, you, you can't do an asset sale. Let me digress for just a second. There's two ways to buy a business. You can buy all the assets or you can buy the stock of the company. With buying an asset, you would need a transfer of the license. So that's not going to work because the licenses are not transferable. So what you have to do is you have to buy all the, the stock of the company. But there's a couple of traps there for the unwary. And that is um, in California, if you acquire more than 80% of the outstanding stock of a company, that, of a cannabis company, that company needs to shut down and cease operations until the new owners are approved by the governmental authorities to be cannabis owners, where they run the background checks on them, they get personal financials on them, et cetera, the whole you know, permitting licensing process. So it's important what we do is we structure those transactions into two steps. The first step is a sale of less than 80% of the business. And then you notify the governmental authorities of this sale and they do their due diligence on the buyer and the background checks on the buyers and you get them approved to coming on the license. And then once they're approved to coming on the license, then you sell the balance of the stock to them. And that way you don't have to shut down operations while the new owners are being approved by the requisite governmental authorities. Okay. And you, you mentioned private companies in the U S that are making acquisitions right now. Would, would any of these acquirers uh, fall into the category of either, you know, private equity backed, uh, companies or, or family uh, family office type businesses. These are companies with money behind them, presumably. There are there are some private offices that are looking at doing that, and um, you know some some smaller VC firms. Casa Verde, you know, is a, is a perfect example. Their their whole goal is to make investments in cannabis businesses, both plant touching and ancillary businesses, um, and they're backed with either family office money from elsewhere. Um, or just, you know, well-heeled investors that are looking for a place to, to put their money and have confidence in these, these smaller quasi-VC firms that are uh, making um, these investments. I think there's another one, is it called um, Privateer? It might be called Privateer um, that is also doing these kinds of deals. Um, so there's not a lot of them. You know, I know maybe half a dozen or so, um, and there are more, and, and more will come. You know, but it's not the Silicon Valley, you know, typical VC money at this mm -hmm. point. Um, it's still a, a one-off kind of show. And are you seeing any money that's coming from, say, Wall Street through any sort of mechanism to be, you know, invested in, in local cannabis industries? And if so, how, what, what structure of holdings would they have? You know, I'm not really seeing Wall Street okay. money come in at this point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, and it, so I don't see any of the Wall Street firms doing it. You know, it may be some of the uh, pretty wealthy individuals who are, you know, shareholders and principals and managing directors of those Wall Street firms. Mm -hmm. You know, they're putting their money or forming separate, <clears throat> smaller, you know, VC companies to make those investments. But I'm not seeing the, the Wall Street money come in directly. It would come in indirectly uh, from the owners and the managing directors. Okay, that makes perfect sense that they would have a, a separate, um, a, a separate entity that 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 smaller degree of ownership, that sort of thing, and not involve their major firm in some sort of holding. Yeah. Uh, what What are the most common 
target companies that you're seeing these days? Did dispensaries, manufacturing, all the above? And what are they um, looking cultivation. for? Cultivation. <clears throat> okay. I'm cultivation. seeing uh, cultivation. You know, and in my opinion, the, 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 the way to make money in this space right now um, is not retail. It's manufacturing and distribution and then testing labs. But obviously the, on the testing lab side, you know, it's a pretty significant capital investment for all the equipment and the scientists and everything to run that testing lab. So you're seeing people who have existing testing labs, say in the environmental area, but their equipment, their mass spectrometers, et cetera, can also be used to test cannabis product. So they're starting to get into the space. Um, my opinion, manufacturing is a phenomenal play right now because you can set up what's called a toll processing operation or contract packaging where, yeah, you're manufacturing your own stuff, um, your own products, but you can also manufacture for others as a contract packager called co-packing. And that's, um, that's been around for years and years and years in a prior life. You know, I used to have a chocolate company and we made a liquid chocolate candy bar. Um, and it was in um, 89 Valero gas station, 89 Valero, no, no, 89 Sam's Clubs. There we go. 89 Sam's Clubs, 750 Valero gas stations. Um, and I used a co-packer, which was a, a, someone who had a manufacturing operation that manufactured the chocolate. And they used my formula and they made it, they packaged it, they boxed it up, they palletized it, and they shipped it to a fulfillment warehouse where then I would fulfill orders from that fulfillment warehouse. Well, when you bring that model to the cannabis space, you've got a manufacturing operation. You can keep your, your doors open, you know, 24 seven because you can, and running three shifts because you can be, you know, manufacturing your own products. You have a, a license and you're manufacturing your own products, but you can also manufacture products for other licensees under their name, using their packaging, their materials, their formula um, for what you're making. And therefore in the manufacturing process, the whole key is, you know, keeping your business running, keeping your, doing three shifts a day, you know, 24 seven, that's how a manufacturer is really going to make money. And so I'm, I'm really bullish on that aspect of the space, manufacturing and toll processing, and then distribution. Um, the, the distribution in the cannabis space is fairly anemic. Um, and it's fairly antiquated. And so I think there's real opportunities for distribution companies in that space um, to build a better mousetrap or just use what normal distributors use. You buy it at one price and you sell it at another price and, you, and your, your profit is the margin. Um, and so you're not subject to fluctuations in wholesale prices um, because you can, um, <clears throat> you, can manuf you can buy for one price and, and sell for another. But what I've heard from people in the cultivation space is that it, it's hard to find enough demand within the legal channels to sell. Uh, and what I hear from dispensary owners is that, you know, this isn't quite the, the, the ATM that we expected, that uh, after paying all these taxes and, and, the, and the exorbitant expenses of, of owning a dispensary, the margins are very low. This is nothing like what the the numbers that they were led to believe when they got started. So it's, it's just not an easy place. And it makes complete sense that right now the M&A activity would focus on, on other uh, participants, uh, other ancillary service providers and manufacturing and other people in the chain of distribution uh, that, are, that are just kind of safer bets at this juncture. Does that sound fairly? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, margins at retail are razor thin absolutely razor thin and you know and i've got clients that have both cultivation and retail licenses um and they make their money on cultivation they don't make it on the retail mm -hmm. you know it's 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 that simple um the retail is almost a, a lost leader to to get their brands out there uh from a cultivation standpoint or a manufacturing standpoint so i agree wholeheartedly retail is a tough tough business right now and it's not the you know the green rush that everybody thought it would be. And that's a lot because of the tax structure in N280E. Mm -hmm. So would you say for, with the people that are in the, the, um, the retail space right now, that, that it, this is just a marathon, that at some point you will be able, you will be in a more profitable business, but you've got to ride this out. This is not, this is not a good time to, to jump ship. This is not a good time to, to you know, to cash your chips in, this is a good time to ride it out and, and grind here. Is that? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. 
um, you know, and, and if you can hit, if you can be cash flow positive, um, you can write it out, yeah. you know, but you, you got to find a way to be cash flow positive um, and, and draw people to your retail store. I mean, there's so many retail stores out there, both legal and illegal, you know, in the, in the city, at least in LA, they, they, they don't have the resources, the enforcement resources to go shutting down the, uh, the illegal operation. So um, it's tough. You've got to, like you said, just kind of ride it out right now. Mm -hmm. It, this may be a bit of a curveball for you here, but you know, you mentioned le legal and illegal. Um, you, you go through an M&A transaction, great. We got a laundry list of any M&A transactions. We want reps and warranties galore. And um, you, you've been abiding by every law in the books since the day you were born, you know, and, and good luck getting <laughs> a warm and fuzzy feeling that it, you know, someone participating in the cannabis sector even unintentionally hasn't run afoul of some law and that somehow or another, there could be something coming back and getting you. I mean, getting a deal done and, and the comfort level on the, the reps and warranties of, of legal compliance and that sort of thing. Is there any M and a insurance that you're seeing out there that people can turn to and say, look, wait, we, we can't be a hundred percent sure. And we may, may never get this deal done unless we're able to kind of bridge the gap here. Do you know anybody who's providing that sort of coverage right now? I don't, I don't. That's a really interesting concept. So let me kind of pare it back, but I think I heard, I heard you say, mm -hmm. and that is, you know, basically um, an insurance policy says after I've bought this company, if it turns out that, that there were any uh, pre-closing, you know, violations that I could then get tagged with because I'm, I'm buying stock. So I'm assuming all the liabilities of the business, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I have not seen an insurance product that protects against, you know, pre-closing liabilities. That's a really interesting uh, concept. I'm going to talk, I know a number of brokers who write insurance in the cannabis space, but I haven't, I haven't seen that uh, policy yet. But, you know, like in, in insurance everywhere, <clears throat> if there's a risk, somebody's going to write a policy against it. Right. So I right. uh, just haven't seen that yet. That's a pretty interesting, uh, pretty interesting thought, but I've not seen it yet. I there are insurance policies out there that'll bridge the gap and, and help you get a deal done if if the parties are just had at loggerheads over over reps and warranties and their comfort level over well then let's just go put the money on the table and cover for it um, but it it's an incredibly unique niche here and to, to kind of build up the level of experience and actuarial tables on when these are going to have to pay off. So I mean, yeah, how, how you a, price the policies right how, yeah. how they price the policy in the insurance industry you know, you look at long-term care policies that were sold 20 and 30 years ago. They did not price those properly, those policies properly. And the insurance companies who wrote long-term care policies 20 and 30 years ago, you know, have had substantial losses because of the payouts for long-term care insurance that wasn't prop properly factored in. So, uh, and that's, that's the extent of my knowledge about insurance and actuarial tables. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah. That's an I interesting mean, idea. It is. And may, maybe once there's enough data, you'll have quants somewhere that are cranking out numbers and, and you can get these sorts of policies. But I, I haven't heard of it either, but it would just be, anyway. Um, I think for folks watching though, you mm -hmm. know, if you're, if you're looking to sell your business or even, you know, anytime you start a business, and I think you said at the beginning, you, you know, you start with the end in mind, right? You always have to start with the end in mind. So if you're starting any kind of cannabis business, what is your end goal? Is your end goal to have a lifestyle business that you're going to run for the next 20 or 30 years and it's going to afford you with a very nice lifestyle? Or are you looking to run a business for sale? And you build your company a different way from the beginning and through its, uh, its life, depending on what your ultimate goal is lifestyle business or strategic sale. Um, and if it's strategic sale, you know, you've got to make sure from the beginning that you have all of the right policies and procedures in place. You've hired the right accountants, you've hired the right lawyers, because you, everything you do <clears throat> is going to be examined under a microscope by your prospective acquirer. You know, who's going to buy you is going to look back and look at everything that you've done so they're comfortable that you've run that business legitimately. So if you're starting out or you've decided now that you, you do want to enter into a liquidity event that you do ultimately want to sell the, sell the business, you know, you've got to get the right professionals involved, CPAs, insurance guys, lawyers, et cetera, so that as you're going through the due diligence process with the prospective buyer, 
you know, you don't have all these mea culpas that you've got to do. You don't have all these issues because that's going to chase the buyer away. Mm-hmm. It's they're, they're going to get cold feet or it's going to be too much brain damage for them. So start now to build your business and your advisory team of your lawyers and accountants, et cetera. Um, so you are in a position later on to, to close the sale and not have it mm-hmm. derailed. If you, if you were an owner of a cannabis business today and you're, you are looking to make an exit strategy, this is the right time for you in your life or the stress of the business isn't working well for you or for whatever reason, uh, family, career, otherwise, this is the time to make an exit. What, what buyers out there are going to be the best ones to look to to pay the, the highest price to acquire you? Would you take? Probably the guys doing the roll-ups. Okay. You know? Um, because they're going to achieve the greatest synergies from having multiple cannabis businesses under one roof. You know, whereas if you're just selling to someone who wants to get into the space, they're not going to achieve those same synergies. You know, they may pay more because they just don't know better, but that's a, that's not a good thing to rely upon. You know, typically the, the company that's doing a roll up, they're going to be tough negotiators, no doubt. Um, but potentially they would pay the highest price because they're going to be, they're going to be able to achieve the greatest profits by bringing that additional store within their umbrella and saving from all the synergies that that affords. Okay. So you typically, this isn't something you want to look to another serial entrepreneur or merger of equals, that sort of thing, or, or even like a business that's, that's not already in cannabis. This is going to be uh, again, uh, thin ice for them to tread out on um, and, and put the maximum dollar into that. You want to find somebody that's in cannabis now that is established a, a bigger fish. Is that and has the money to close. Yeah. You know, I mean, you yeah. want to make sure that, that they, they have the funds to close that deal. Um, or if you're going to carry back paper, you know, as the, as the seller, you know, you want to make sure that, guess what? If you're carrying back paper, they're going to be able to make good, you know, on that paper mm-hmm. um, going forward on that promissory note. And for the paper, I mean, uh, the promissory note. I'll give you one last question here. Uh, if people are looking to write a letter of intent today and, or sign one, and we want to get this deal done, you would prepare them most to, to get the deal closed and not have it hit a glitch that kills the deal what would you tell them to keep in mind, make sure we do this and, and get the deal closed? Uh, this is what could kill our deal at the end of the day. I mean, they've already been operating the business and now it just becomes a process of negotiating it and closing it. What would you advise them to do? You know, that's a great question. Um, and it's the same advice I give my clients when they're trying to get a bank account. Be transparent. Don't hide anything. You never want to surprise your banker. And if someone's looking to buy your business, you never want to surprise them. So if you, if you know, if you've got warts, if you got issues, get them out on the table early so you can deal with them. You don't want them, you don't want them being surprised at the 11th hour, delaying the closing, et cetera. Time kills deals. So be completely 100% transparent. And if there are issues, there are hiccups, there's warts, you know, on the deal, get those out on the table, disclose them early so you can deal with it and it doesn't derail your deal and and you don't lose the deal because you've surprised them with something. And like I said, that's the same thing I tell my clients when they want to get a bank account, you got to tell your bank everything. The last thing you ever want to do is surprise your banker because you're going to lose your bank account. Super. And and I'm glad to hear that because that's conventional wisdom that I share with people in all industries. Before the closing, it's like a marriage. Before you get married, your defects will be known. So the thing to do is to make them fall in love with you first, and then you be the one to share with them what the defect is. If they figure out what your defect is, it's going to work against you in a much worse way than if you lay it on the table, get it out there. So that, that's super advice to share. Ken, I really appreciate your time. This is super advice for everybody. I mean, this, is, this has got broad applicability to industries, but for everyone in the cannabis space, Ken is the guy to turn to in Southern California and probably all over. So I really appreciate your time and your expertise and I hope you have a great rest of the week and a good weekend. 
All right. Well, listen, thank you very much. Um, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Um, it was wonderful to be here and, you know, stay safe and, and wear a mask. Absolutely. Right? Yep. <laughs> Thanks so much. And, and wear a mask, my friends. All right. Be, take care. Bye-bye. Be well. Nothing more important than your health. Yeah. Everyone else, thank you so much for joining us. And we will see you next time on Selling Your Business with David King.